what are the many parts that make a machine learning system feel like it works so magically, Chip? Explainability factor is important, so they tend to gear towards more simpler models with less parameters, but they're easier to explain. And on the other spectrum, there are some use cases like it's just like incredibly large models that care more about the accuracy and the output than the explainability. So, um, so it really depends on your use cases. Like how much magic do you want? I feel like if you build an application, it should be production ready by default. And the reason it's necessary nowadays still is because a lot of people still not think about productions when they build machine learning models. Chip, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. When I posted last week that you were going to be a guest on the show and to ask the audience if they had any questions for you, it was my most viewed post of all time. It had over 100,000 impressions in 24 hours. So I'm excited about this episode. I know our audience is excited about this episode. Chip, welcome to the show. Where in the world are you calling in from? Yeah, I'm so excited. Maybe you should have me on the show more often then. Um, yeah, I'm calling <laughs> from San Francisco. Um, yeah, so I'm from Vietnam, maybe living here for a while. Nice. Are you in New York, right? I am in New York. Thank you for asking. Yeah, not you know, it's not very often that the guests are asking me questions. But I was warned. You did warn me before we started recording that you might get into teacher mode and start asking me lots of questions. So I appreciate you giving me a softball up front. <laughs> so you know, it's funny because before I got into tech, I was actually working as a reporter. So for me, really? like I, I'm very used to asking people questions instead of being asked questions. So if you give me a chance, I would. I was just going to ask you a question because you do run a very popular podcast and I do want to get <laughs> on the secrets. Nice. Uh, well, does that relate to in doing research for you before bringing you on the show? This isn't something I was planning to talk about on air, but is it from your reporting career that you wrote four books in Vietnamese before you were in data science? So I found out Early on, is this one of the like writing is one of the things you could do without having to interact like with the employers, right? Like so actually like my mm -hmm. editor didn't find out that I was still in high school. So it's just one time she was <laughs> writing for her for a while. And um one day we had a conference about like a tech conference and they had like some high profile people from the government to show up. And the person who was supposed to take the shorthand note of like some, I don't know, some higher persons couldn't show up. So my editor was like, hey, Chip, can you like come here really quickly? Be here in 30 minutes. I was like, yeah, sure. And they show up and she was like, really? Is that you? Your face is so <laughs> young. I can't possibly put you like next to that person. But uh, so yeah, but but that's how I started. And definitely like, it was definitely like a good, how to say, a good trial run for me so that I could write a book later. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, you have a yeah. lot of interesting stuff in your background. We're going to dig into a lot of it <laughs> in this show. Um, so I was introduced to you through Harpreet Sahota, very kind Ooh, of him. Oh, he's yeah. great. Yeah. He's wonderful. He was in episode number 457, one of the first episodes when I took over as host of the show. Yeah, he is so fashionable. He <laughs> he is very me fashionable. Yeah. yeah. And his beard is always immaculately trimmed. I know. He looks so good. Uh, he does. And he's got a great voice too. <laughs> yeah, um, no, he's a good podcast host. And then... Um, I think we have somebody, well, we're about to have somebody else in common uh, soon too. So as I was researching for the show, I was reading mm -hmm. the people who had given toast testimonials at the front of your book. And one of those people is Josh Wills. And his name is on my mind because we're also doing research for his episode because that's coming up very soon as well. And so I was wondering, Chip, if you have a message <laughs> for Josh. Josh is my hero. I wish we could like hang out more he is such an interesting person and the thing he says is like it can be just very short but very memorable like he has some very famous tweets uh just like very interesting ways of like looking at things mm -hmm. so josh um is great and i'm very happy you're getting him on the show yeah his tweets are epic and he seems like a very funny person i can't wait to get him on and I very kind be... as well oh cool um it seems like a lot of people in this industry are kind <laughs> I mean, it's maybe it's easy to be kind. As was somebody, somebody was telling me, it's like, I would be kind to you if I make like a lot of money a year. <laughs> like, so it's, maybe, like, it's easy to be kind when you are in a more, okay, I'm not saying, I'm not, okay, so, okay, sorry. I didn't want to make it sound like I'm dismissing people's kindness. I mean, it still takes effort to be kind. But I do think it's like, say, if you make like 
Okay, I'm not gonna go into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying. It it yeah. relieves some of the stresses, and so people mm-hmm. can be kinder. But uh, interestingly, I mean, this is maybe going to be kind of controversial, mm-hmm. but famously, people working in high finance are, you know, they're famously mean. And like, you know, oh. every kind of, right? So that's kind of, that's an interesting thing. So I don't think Good that that's... Good sample, yeah. Yeah, it's not the only factor. I think, I think a big part of it is that people working in data science, there's a lot of intellectual stimulation. Yeah. Um, and I think the field is so quickly moving and there are so many people with so many different areas of expertise that you're quickly humbled and yeah. you kind of, you have to be nice to some, like to everyone, because you know, <laughs> deep down yeah. that, you know, such a tiny little slice of the yeah. whole field and you're going to need a lot of help. And the whole field, actually, this is another thing that's very different from yeah. finance is that in finance, you're trying to keep all of your secrets to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But in data science, we're publishing open source code. You're yeah. making courses and books about all of your secrets, and yeah. you're sharing them with the world. Yeah, I do think that open source nature does really help with like collaborations and like bringing people together. So, speaking of giving things to the world, you are the author of the best-selling book, "Designing Machine Learning Systems," which is based on your lectures for your Stanford course of a very similar name. Not exactly the same name, but pretty close. <laughs> I couldn't uh, get the if, same name. <laughs> yeah, if people I wish Google. I could, yeah. Uh, yeah, Stanford, uh, the name of the course was machine learning systems design when you last offered it in, uh, winter 2022. Um, so, uh, the reason why I say giving things away is because O'Reilly, your publisher has very kindly agreed to give away five digital copies of your book, designing machine learning systems. And so, uh, the, the morning that your episode is published, I will do a post on my personal LinkedIn account announcing the episode and the first five people who comment that they would like a copy of the book will get a free digital copy of the book. Nice. So, yeah. So um, let's talk about your book. So machine learning engineering has existed as a profession for a few years now. Why did you write this book? Why was now the right time for this book? So, um, yeah, so, so I was just looking it up yesterday. It's like machine learning engineering. It's like started picking up around, I think I start like Google, on Google Trends, right? You see that if you search for Google machine learning engineer, it would start like, you see that it start picking out like 2015 as really like start getting momentum, like around like 2017, 2018. And it was about the same time that I started joining like NVIDIA. And at first I was just making notes of things that I experienced and learned and actually like I, d- I wasn't I didn't plan on writing a book it was just like okay here's a note and I thought just, um, the best way to learn about something is to just post it out there right you know we were saying like the best way to get the right answer is to give the wrong answers and both will be very <laughs> quick to like, correct you so it was just like, I think it was younger at that time. I was like, okay, I'm here to learn and I make a disclaimer. So I'm here to learn. And I got a lot of good feedback. So it was like an 8,000 word note I put on GitHub. And I think it got mm-hmm. quite popular. Um, and then so that evolved into a course at Stanford. And during the process of the course, I also wrote a lot of lecture notes. So I also like continue getting a lot of feedback and over the time ta- over time it just looks like a book and that's how the book came around. So um there's another rule of thumb that people tell uh, people told me is that like if people ask you the same question three times, it's time to write a blog post. Right. So over the last years he says that ever since uh, ever since machine learning engineering has become a thing, um, I kept encountering the same questions and questions uh, over and over again. So I thought like maybe my book can help answer some of those questions. Yeah, it's an extraordinary book. It has such a, a crazy amount of detail on all the topics people know need to know about bringing machine learning into production and having that production system work effectively. We're gonna talk a bunch in this episode about it. Really quickly, you mentioned your NVIDIA background there. And at NVIDIA, your title was Deep Learning Engineer. So is that like relative to this machine learning engineering field where in machine learning engineering, um, and, and you can disagree with my kind of definition of this, but the kind of definition that I tend to give on air is that the machine learning engineer is the person on a team that's responsible for taking the model weights after they've yeah. been trained and putting them yeah. into a production system. So does a deep learning engineer 
How does that differ from a regular machine learning engineer? So I do think that the roles really depend on the organization. So even like in the same company, two people with the same title, but if they're on different teams, might have very different jobs. So my job, delivering engineer, I was part of the applied research organizations. So my job wasn't really about uh, bringing models to production, but it was more like helping our customers prototype and showing that, hey, this idea has the potential to make great impact in production. So that, that was also like, uh, so a lot of our team worked on like about a publishing paper and my job was like to help like research scientists like run experiments and build things so that they can publish papers as well. So it was through the, the jobs that I realized that like a very big, big challenge in the industry is how to actually bring those prototypes into productions. And I learned a lot from our customers. A lot of questions I got for the book were also from the customers that we were working with. Nice, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are you moving from batch to real-time? Pathway makes real-time machine learning and data processing simple. Run your pipeline in Python or SQL in the same manner as you would for batch processing. With Pathway, it will work as is in streaming mode. Pathway will handle all of the data updates for you automatically. The free and source available solution based on a powerful Rust engine ensures consistency at all times. Pathway makes it simple to enrich your data, create and process machine learning features and draw conclusions quickly. All developers can access the enterprise proven technology for free at pathway.com. Check it out. And uh, to, to uh, understand a little bit better about how you were able to create a course at Stanford, surely that isn't the kind of opportunity that everybody gets, right? So, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh yeah, I was doing this machine learning engineering or deep learning engineering and people were asking me questions. So I was starting to write blog posts and writing things in GitHub. And then I realized <laughs> I started to have a course. And so Stanford, <laughs> let me make a course. Um, yeah. So how did that come about? I guess uh, from reviewing your LinkedIn profile, it looks like you had been an instructor of other courses, maybe that other people had created already at Stanford. So you kind of built up this re reputation as an instructor. So I do think that um, a lot of things is just, I feel like, so my friends, uh, I, we talk at, um, so my friends, I used to, think, used to say that everyone who ends up in Silicon Valley has have, have had a lot of luck. And I think that's true for uh, for me as well. So of course, like, it's not quite easy to like start a course at Stanford, but it's a lot easier if you already went to Stanford and knew the processes there, right? right. So um, I think like for me, it started as um, so when I joined doing um, studying computer science, I started out as a section leader, which is more like of a teaching assistant role for a uh, for an introductory CS course at Stanford. So I got to know like teaching, I thought I really enjoyed it. Um, and then after that, Stanford has this very interesting concept that I actually knew from my friends. It's called a student initiated course. So like as a student, you can initiate a course for uh, and, and teach it if you got approval from the curriculum committee. So um, so at first, so my first student initiated course was a TensorFlow course because um, for my sophomore summer, I was interning as a machine learning engineer intern. And I got to know TensorFlow. I think TensorFlow was, uh, came out in like November 2015. So by 2016, there was not a lot of materials about it. So I, I, really, I thought it was really, really useful um, to, as a tool. So I wanted to learn more about it. So I came back to, to my school and was like, asked some of my professors, like, hey, can you teach a course on it? And my professors were like, I don't have time. Like, why don't you teach a course on it? So they did help me like get the course on TensorFlow started. So that's how I learned uh, so about the process had, of start a course. You created yeah. a TensorFlow course before your designing machine learning systems course. Yeah, I think I did that when I was in college. Wow, when you were an undergrad. Yeah, I think it was a, it was a pretty steep learning curve because I was realizing I was, at some point I feel like I was doing three jobs because I was doing my degree and then I was like being a teaching assistant for another mm -hmm. course and then teaching my mm -hmm. own course. So oh it was goodness. quite, it was quite a little bit juggling, but I feel like I learned a lot. I would say that's the biggest thing I learned that I like is really deep cut in my flesh is this like tools get outdated very quickly. So I remember I built my course on TensorFlow, right? It was a TensorFlow 1.0, and mm -hmm. at the time nobody could mm -hmm. put 1.0, right? Mm -hmm. But then they changed to 2.0. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's like, if I want to teach the course again, I would have to like redo 
like 80% mm -hmm. of my oh, tutorials. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, tools just go in and out of fashion very quickly. Like, so mm -hmm. I chose not to focus on tools for my next course, but focus more on the fundamentals. And that's the same thing for for my book. And I do get a lot of comments, like if like from people like saying that, oh, there's not a lot of code snippets in the in the book. So yes, they are not like it's not a tutorial book. So it's not gonna teach you like how to use good flow, how to use whatever tools is in fashion nowadays. Uh, but it's more like asking a lot of questions to help you pick the right tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the the topic that you picked, this machine learning systems design, this is evergreen. Um, I hope so. I mean, this art is like, what is evergreen in the world is changing so fast now. <laughs> I don't know. I think so. It's these kinds of principles that you cover in the book. Um, I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon. And I can really empathize with what you went through because I similarly, I got started in content creation by yeah. creating a course about TensorFlow 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then yeah. I had to redo it all for TensorFlow 2. I did redo it all. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I'm really happy to have had that experience, yeah. but that is also why my second big content area is about yeah. the mathematical foundations of machine learning, because I'm pretty confident that things like linear algebra, calculus, <laughs> probability theory, that's not going to go away from machine learning. So, yeah, um, yeah. I do think the souls are like good skills to acquire as well. I do think there's something like, for example, um, probability. Of statistics. I think that mm -hmm. everyone should know more about it, regardless of whether you're doing machine learning or not. Because like having a good understanding of probability does help a lot in choosing careers. For example, like some careers, <laughs> like returns, are follow more of the number distribution. So if you become like a teacher or a software engineer, you might not like become super rich, but you want to become like super poor, right? But like some careers, like writing. Like being artists follow a more of the long tail distribution. So like only right. a few people will actually make it. So having a good understanding of that also very helps. Also helps a lot. Um, or like um, I think I wrote a, a post uh, on like how to apply statistics into life. Another is like how to the view on luck. So uh, it does taught me a lot like how to be humble. Because, uh, so like one example, right? Like you have a lot of, um, if, you deal, if you deal a thousand people, two cards, right? So this is just by random chance. Some of them would end up with two aces, right? So like, they don't have to do anything. It's a pure chance. Right. So we do right. see a lot of people just like succeed just by pure chance. Like some, mm -hmm. like for example, like a lot of people have ideas about social media, social network, but some of them will emerge to be like successful. Uh, and, and I don't think it's like, I'm not going to dismiss like the success of other people, but I do say there's a big component of luck in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, but as you say, you can make decisions that um, that take advantage of those probabilities. So for example, you were talking about how um, a career like being a software engineer, the yeah. compensation is kind of like a normal distribution, whereas something yeah. like being a writer or a content creator is a very long tail on the, on the distribution. Yeah. And so then you could be quite strategic. You could say, okay, I'm going to have my stable software engineering job. I'm yeah. going to commit to doing that for you know for my eight hours a day. And yeah. then I'm going to have my two to four hours a day in the evening or weekends or whatever yeah. to focus on my creative writing career and give myself a shot at, at that long tail. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand things like the, the risk factors and how to best like structures our life to like reduce the risk factors is like, I think it's a very useful knowledge you have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, if people want to access my <laughs> probability theory for machine learning course, it's in the O'Reilly platform already. Yeah. Um, so nice yeah, I mean, I, I open up the course by saying <laughs> yeah. this is yeah. like, I think the most valuable topic to, to take, because even if you're not in machine learning, these concepts are so useful for thinking about in your regular life. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, yeah, so, and we also have through, um, a, a relationship that the podcast has with O'Reilly, we have a special 30 day free trial of the O'Reilly yeah. platform. It's SPS yeah. pod 23. So if you, yeah. if you wanted a copy of Chip's book and you don't manage to be one of the first five people to comment <laughs> on the post and get one, you can use the SDS pod 23 to, to yeah. get that. Anyway, so let's dig more into the book, Chip. So the subtitle of your book is an iterative process for production ready applications. Could you parse that out for our listeners? <laughs> what is a production ready application? How important is iteration? Uh, yeah. 
Tell us about I, it. I think it's funny you use the word of parse because I feel like it's a very <laughs> software engineering term. Uh, I don't think normal. Do, do, do people outside tech use a, a I think word it's parse I think it's like technically that? correct, though yeah. probably not as widely used outside yeah, of software. I see. Engineering. No, no, that's funny. So um, I'm going to be like absolutely honest here. I dream of the day when the phrase production ready will become redundant. So we don't say something like, eating ready food, right? Like what is the point of like making food if it's not ready to be eaten, right? So so I feel right. like, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm a big fan of food. So <laughs> and all my metaphors are related. I think even even our company's name, like Claypot, is inspired by food. <laughs> so, um, so I think the production ready applications, I feel like if you build an application, it should be production ready by default. And the reason it's necessary nowadays still is because a lot of people still not think about productions when they build machine learning models uh, or doing experiment. So for example, um, maybe things have changed over time, but I would say like when I was uh, interning at Netflix, so people have heard about Netflix price, right? I was very eager. So I came as an intern and I went to the director of algorithm and was like, so who, how, how is that the winning solutions doing? Because it seems so glamorous, we did so great. And, and he was like, we never actually deployed it. And the reason is that it's, it's very uh, hard to deploy because it was an ensemble um, algorithms. And even though it could edge out, really good performance on like a leaderboard, um, leadership board, no, wait, leaderboard, starting yeah, competition. Leaderboard. <laughs> <laughs> Too much leadership talk. Um, <laughs> it's not really easy to to bring to production. So that was my first lesson. And as I always saw um, a lot more of it, uh, like, um, so first of all, like, uh, another is that like a models can be brought to production, but they just don't stay in production for very long. So one classic example that I've seen a lot um, is that like a company would bring out uh, in on a consultant to have them build a ML models, and uh, they take like maybe six months to build and a few more months to deploy, and it works great in the beginning, but after a few months, it just doesn't work anymore. It's because things have changed, and now the company have like the environments, uh, business requirement have changed. So for example, like that company might be a, uh, say supermarket and they might bring on someone to build a model to predict inventory, like inventory management. So after, th after a few months, after a year in production is a model, like we have a lot of new items, right? That what people want to buy have changed over time because trends in the market. So the models just don't predict uh, correctly anymore. So now the like supermarket has like several options, right? You can either bring in the same consulting firm like uh, and pay them a lot extra money, or you can just like build something like from, so in-house from scratch. So I think that's a painful lesson that a lot of companies have experienced. So you, when, when we do things about like building a model, so you think about like first, whether they can, de can be deployed and second, like how to make it like continually work in production. So that's where the iterative, uh, iter uh, iterative comes from. Cool. Uh, that was a really great explanation. And I, I love the analogy to food. Um, it makes some, it's such a crystal clear way to describe it to say, you know, people don't spend time in the kitchen 80% of the time to then yeah. throw out the food. But yeah. that's what happens in machine learning is something like 80% of the time machine learning models are created, or at least a machine learning project is started. And it doesn't make it into production. Nobody gets to eat the model. So I think I would like challenge on the statistics because it's very hard thing to measure, right? Because right. like the nature of machine learning um, is experimentation. So you just experiment with a lot of models. So it's by nature, so a lot of them are not going to make it to production because you probably want to deploy the best one, not one of them. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's kind of like, um, yeah, I guess because a way that the food analogy is quite different is that typically like we're making the food one meal at a time and yeah. we only spend like an hour preparing dinner. Whereas yeah. with a machine learning model, you might spend months or years in some cases. And yeah. then, so you don't want to, <laughs> yeah. you, you want to make sure that that was time well spent, uh, especially if you have different competing options for your machine learning solution. Yeah. You, you want to like, so I think for a lot of companies, like machine learning is a tool. I think it is a tool, right? And when you invest your tool, you want to see return out of it. So like if like doesn't matter like how fancy the model is, if you can't really show concrete returns on business, I don't think you're gonna have you're not gonna you're not gonna get promoted. You're not gonna 
in, in a lot of cases, we see that companies invest a lot in machine learning and then they just don't really get good returns and the whole team just get laid off. I think a very painful lesson is like Zillow estimates, uh, Zestimates, right? I think, uh, are you mm-hmm. familiar with, with the, with the oh, case yeah. study? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to recap. So I think like they, they did have a competition similar to Netflix price. So it was like mm-hmm. a million dollars winning price. And they did a lot of marketing campaign on it and say, like, okay, now we're not using the state of the art to like predict housing price really well. And a year later, they reported a loss of like $800 million and they just like laid off, I think, the entire Zillow offers team or something like that of like 2,000 people. Yeah, I guess it's... it. That kind of problem, I don't know the problem super well, but you might know better than me. Perhaps some of the issue was uh, feature drift, where the yeah. world changes. So the model works perfectly on historical data, but yeah. then something like the COVID pandemic happens yeah. and the factors that are driving house prices completely change, but yeah. you still got the same model weights pre-pandemic. Yeah, so that's a very important like to make the model like adaptive to the changing environment, right? So you need to constantly iterate on the model so you think change. I think COVID is one of the extreme examples, but I think like there are a lot of things that can affect a model performance in production. It's just like trends go over time, so competitors launch a new marketing campaign, or you user sell launch a new market, or it's just because of things that change over time. Yeah. Recently, in episode number 655, Keith McCormick and I discussed the importance of managing the machine learning lifecycle effectively. To allow you to learn about Keith's approach to all phases of the lifecycle, he's kindly making his Predictive Analytics Essentials course available for free. All you have to do is follow Keith McCormick on LinkedIn and follow the special hashtag SDSKeith. The link gives you temporary course access, but with plenty of time to finish it. Mastering machine learning project management is just as important as learning algorithms. Check out the hashtag SDSKeith on LinkedIn to get started right away. The world is always changing and our machine learning models aren't necessarily always learning and adapting, though I suspect a big part of your designing machine learning systems is to have our machine learning models continuously adapting. Yeah, and I think like it's uh, I feel like for every application the rate of change is not different. Right? And like some some applications they, they're going to change very very fast, but some applications are going to change a lot faster. Uh so so I do think it's like one important thing is like to measure like if you delay updating the models and how much performance hit you're going to get. So say like uh Facebook early days like in in the maybe like 10 years ago internet didn't move quite fast, right? So they did run some experiments and they found out that for their model as click-through predictions, uh, if they had something like a uh, delay model update by like a week, it caused some significant performance hit compared to like updating the model every day. So they chose to move update to every day, but like it was 10 years ago. But nowadays the world moves even faster. So we've seen some experiments, people was found out as like, so LinkedIn, they found out that like the model, the features of staleness just go from like an hour compared to a minute would reduce their performance by three point something percent for their recommender system. So, so I think like the rate of change very depends on applications, um, very depends on where you are, what industry you're in. Yeah, it's, it's wild. I think we anticipate, you know, if you do a Google search right now, or maybe a LinkedIn search, you yeah. expect some current news to be reflected in that search right away. So yeah. like there's some major news event happening and you're like, oh my goodness, I want to learn all about this. And so I think yeah. people don't appreciate how complex it is and the amount of compute that has to be going into constantly uh, scouring the internet and looking for updates so that your Google search update reflects current news. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So these kinds of machine learning systems feeling like they work magically. Um, <laughs> obviously, they aren't magic. It's just machine learning engineering happening under the hoods, uh, under the hoods <laughs> of these different yeah. platforms. So um, what are the many parts that make a machine learning system feel uh, like it works so magically, Chip? Okay, so so I really like a quote by like Arthur C. Clarke uh, that says it's like any uh, any technology is sufficiently complex would be indistinguishable from magic just because we 
don't understand it, it seems like magic to us, right? So I do think there's a lot of things about machine learning that is like hard to understand. So I think it's like it's a shift from traditional software to machine learning. I think people have been talking about it a lot. So I hope you don't mind me repeating it. So for traditional software, usually it takes a takes the input. And you explain the transformation, so like uh, like a function. So it's like okay, takes the input, multiply by three, and add something, something, blah blah. So you can do exact calculations, and you get the output. But whereas for machine learning, you do it other way around. You have the input and the output, and you tell the algorithm like, hey, figure out the function. How is that so we can produce input from the output? And because of that, that we don't really understand the functions that the machine learning algorithm comes up with. So, uh, and I think it's not like, it's just like one, it's not like a small function, right? Like a model is gonna have like many, many parameter, parameters, like I think like billions of them, like in, in the certain, in like nowadays. So it's just impossible. Like it's really hard for us to just look at all these numbers and understand exactly what's going on. So there's a whole industries of like, just trying to understand what exactly, how exactly do this machine learning systems make predictions so some of this is like uh, this for some industry where being, being able to understand how machine learning algorithms make decisions um so where, where where the explainability factor is important then they tend to gear towards more simpler models with less parameters but the easy easier to explain and on the other spectrum, there are some use cases um, like it's just like incredibly large models that care more about the accuracy and the output than the explainability. So, um, so it really depends on your use cases. Like, how much magic do you want to like get to right. here? Yeah, yeah. This is this is often a trade off today, right? Where we could say, okay, let's go with the regression model that has maybe slightly less accuracy, but we understand exactly how each weight contributes yeah. to the outcome of the model. Uh, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, like you're saying, we could have some uh, deep learning architecture with billions of model parameters. And there's no way, like even if we use explainable AI techniques to try to kind of understand how some model weights contribute in some particular circumstances, there are so many factors that, um, it will never be fully explainable, but it might have slightly higher accuracy on some tasks. So I do think this like the requirements for expl explainability will change over time, depending on the level of trust we can build with users, right? For example, like an example, interesting, like microwave, like we have such a high level of trust with microwaves that we are okay to put food inside mm -hmm. it. Right, like mm -hmm. just use it without understanding exactly how it works. I don't think like many people understand how microwaves work. So I do think that in the future, if we have a lot more trust with AI, we can just like a lot of applications will open up because now now we can be comfortable bringing up pushing really complex models that have really good performance without having to explain to people how they work underneath the hood. But I feel like we're still a little bit far from there. Yeah, well, something that's cool that's starting to happen more and more today are these like model cards. Have you come across yeah. those that like explain um, where the models are strong or where they might have issues? So like, for example, ChatGPT, obviously really incredible at surfacing some answers, but yeah. is capable of very confidently lying. So you shouldn't be making like an important business decision based on some chat GPT. Now you're talking alone. about the Google board advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's, I, yeah. Go I ahead. do think the big thing about like there's certain aspect of like ML machine learning outputs to just like make it harder to bring things production, but I don't think they are not solvable. So first of all, like one nature of like ML algorithms, they are like predictive algorithms, right? So like only answers by default up uh, approximations they're not like exact computations when you can like know like okay the answers be exact exactly, say approximations exactly. and if you treat approximations like exact computations then you're in for a world of trouble exactly and that's like so people people at my own company uh yeah. not on my data science team but more business-minded people they're like how long is it going to be john before we can just have GPT-3 API in our platform or ChatGPT API when it comes out in the platform and we don't have to worry about accuracy. And I'm like, I'm like, that I don't know. It's going to be a really yeah. long time because every single token, every single word that it's outputting to you, it's doing that probabilistically. Yeah. Like there's... 
I think that people have come up with designs, like UX designs to make it work. So for example, like um, one thing is just like because approximate, so you can have a lot of them and let user choose the best. So like instead of like entirely automation, it's more like augmentation. So like you give people, so like for example, like instead of like showing the direct response from the model to users, right? You can show users like three different options and they can choose the best one or they can just like, um, or they can like edit on top of that. So maybe it's hard for you to like write the entire email or like entire response from scratch, but like you can just change a little. You can speed up productivity a lot. Or we have seen like quite some like interesting, for example, like um, we have known that like GPT can also generate code, right? So like we, so one, one of my friend has this um, startup. So they can let uh, business owners, small business owners build their own website without knowing how to write code by you just like describe the website, choose it as an input and just output the code. And a lot of times the code doesn't work like perfectly, right? But but like they could show like users like twenty different options for what the code would like look would would would, would like render into a real website, and they choose the best website, and then you can like, iterate on top of that. So like, hey, Jared, more just similar. So I think that could be a very interesting way of like uh, how to interact with things like um, approximate ML results. For sure, yeah, I think augmentation is the key there is to be using these kinds of models for augmenting your creativity in yeah. particular tasks, as opposed to trying to have a definite answer on something. Yeah. Um, so um, related to uh, content from your book, so we were, we've been talking for a while now about this, kind of this magic <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, another great uh, topic area that you cover in your book that I'd love you to tell our audience about is how do you align business intent, context, and metrics with a machine learning project? Yeah, so it's pretty funny. Um, so so we talk about like, it doesn't matter how fancy some machine learning models are, if they don't solve business problems, then they're not gonna right. be used, right? right? So I do think it's like, um, so, so one thing is like, I keep telling my students is that like focus on the problems and not the techniques. Right, so technique is just a tool to solve the problems and like be more like solutions oriented than like technology oriented. So, so like for example, um, one one actual problem we run into is that like, so a company has this problem of like they want to increase the conversion rate from like uh visitor to like register account, right? So like uh somebody new visits to their website and they want the visitors to sign up to create an account. Right. So, so like, what would be the first thing you do? It's not like the first thing you do shouldn't like, Hey, I heard this magical fancy machine learning model to solve this problem and let's just use it. So the first thing you should do is actually understand like why people are not signing up and then try to come up with a solution for that. A lot of times the solutions don't need to be machine learning. So for us, we identified like, three different challenges, like why it didn't happen. So the first one is just like, we saw that somehow the conversion rate was very low for people with smaller screens. And then we check it out and we realized like we didn't do enough testing on the UI side and for the smaller screen, the sign up button was like half hidden and it was pretty hard for what you click on. So it was not even like a machine learning problem at all. Like we very easy fix and then it have us like increase the tongue of my business metric. And another is that like we saw that a lot of people like started the process but did not complete. And the reason is that like the process is pretty long. So like we need to like do some, so it's more, it's not an UI challenge, it's more UX uh, challenge. So we need to reduce the process. And now we have the trade off, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we want to get more information from users to make them like better, give them better services. Uh, but at the same time, we can make it too long. People are also gonna drop out, right? Or, or if we make it too easy, another problem can arise is that like, will be a lot of bots. So because you want the process to be like, hey, you want to make sure that you're real users. Um, but they're like, if people can just sign up without any like needing the phone verification or whatsoever, they might be bought. And we see that challenge a lot for some, uh, one of the companies that I work with. They give out like promotion for signing up. So if you sign up, you can like, claim certain discount. So if everyone can just sign up without significant, without like sufficient verifications, then you can do like promotion abuse. And it could cost them like, I think like million, like tens of millions of dollars a year. So which is like clearly a trade-off, right? Now you want to increase the sign up, but at the same time you don't want to like bleed money. So, but like only the last solution that is like, that is really machine learning, that is just like, oh, it's because people don't find relevant content 
to them. So they just leave without signing up. And that you can even sort without like machine learning in the beginning. You can just choose like maybe I try the popular, uh, show the popular content. Uh, and then after that, you can make more complex. Okay, now let's do more personalizations. Right, like a uh, recommendation for each user. And the first case will be this more like content based, and the next one is maybe more like session based recommendations. So, so there are like very many different ways to solve a business challenge. And I don't think people should just bring out the big gun when they are like, oh, I don't know, cheese knife can solve. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So that helps us understand how important it is for our business to be aligned with a particular machine learning problem. Yeah. Um, I, a related question uh, is from your book. So your book devotes a chapter to training data yeah. and some important subtopics like sampling, labeling, class imbalance, and data augmentation. So um, yeah, what are some of the lessons that you've learned about training data in a business context? Training data is everything. So it's it's really um, it's really interesting um, that you ask these questions non prompted at all. So <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So I think I, I love this story. So I want to tell this. So do you remember the Alex Net paper in twenty twelve? Oh, of course. I talk about it all the time. Yes. So there is like it's a very influential papers, right? If you look at like the most influential papers in the last ten years, in the last decade, I think Alex is very high up. So there's one line in that paper is like everyone pretty much just ignore, and that line is like it's something that other lies like on our experiments showed that we should just wait for more compute and more data to make better progress, right? So like the two things that mentioned like compute. And data, and I think that's just something that's like pretty much set the tone, so the, the the tone for the next decade. You will see like now a lot of progress we saw as like just more compute and more data. And the funny thing is, is like the second author of Alex that paper. Do you know who who that person is? Uh, well, so Alex Krzyzewski is the first, and then the second is Ilya Sutskever, right? Yes. Do you know who Ilya is? Um, I mean, not like personally, um, <laughs> I know that he went to work at OpenAI afterward. Yes. He is a co-founder of OpenAI. So I feel like if you look back, like it's just pretty much like laid out from like 10 years ago. I feel like a lot of people think of like, oh, wow, ChatGPT is such a shock to everyone. But I do think that's like a lot of people saw it coming, right? Yes, more compute, more data. And for a long time, um, I think I just want to point out like, um, OpenAI did not get a papers published because for a while the research committee was like, oh, scaling up models, throwing more compute and more data, uh, or it's like interest, like, yes, of course it brings out good reason, but it's not enough novelty. Like it's like not sufficient, um, interesting new techniques for them to be like published. And a lot of time people argue this like, people, I think as humans, we like to think that progress comes from intelligent human design. Right, we don't want to think it's like oh, just like brute force solutions are gonna be the the best way forward. And I think that Richard um, Sutton has a very interesting paper, uh, like a blog post, very short one, like the bitter lessons. It's, it looks like you know what I'm talking about. Uh, like, you see, like I, I don't know the blog post. I know Richard Sutton. Yeah. Again, not personally. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you might you, maybe you should bring him on the podcast. I would it's love like, to. Amazing, yeah, yeah. I agree. So, uh, so the bigger lesson is that um, so there are two approach, right? Like for uh, he noticed over the last seventy years of um, of AI research, a lot of progress has came from like more compute and more data, and uh, and the other approach is just like intelligent intelligent human design, and of course it's like you can in theory you can pursue both, but like time spent on on one approach. It's gonna take away your time from another, and so a lot of people who believed in like human intelligent design will learn the bitter lesson. It's just they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to make as much progress as the people who just chose the other approach and went on in. Yeah, and that's yeah. actually that's something that, that we have seen a huge amount in recent years. Yeah, like something like okay, the transformer architecture is a novel yeah. way of setting up your deep learning architecture. Okay. Yeah. But then this idea of just scaling it up, you know, adding orders of magnitude, more model parameters. Yes, this yeah. is not very intelligent. Human yeah. intelligence is just brute force, but it works unbelievably well. And yeah. GPT-3 then has all of these emergent capabilities that we were surprised by. And I'm sure GPT-4 is going to have even more. Yeah. Um, and a similar kind of thing happened. Uh, my PhD was in genomics. So yeah. applying machine learning to genetic data. 
And it was the same kind of idea. It was like, let's get orders of magnitude more subject participants and get their yeah. genetic information. And that approach alone, that brute force alone will uh, yield more interesting genes for a particular trait. Like to be clear, like to be fair, like brute forcing is not easy. Like it's incredible engineering challenge. It's a and, big like, engineering problem. Yeah. Coordination challenge. And it's very yeah. hard. It's just like people think like, oh, it's more of an engineering challenge, not a research challenge. But also like when you start operating at like a scale and presented before a lot of new problems arise that you actually need novel techniques to be able to overcome them so i do think it's like it's um it's, it's very hard it's not easy at all so i do um so i was uh I, i'm just reading this book this morning before our call is a book on a chip war and i saw like very similar like uh, a lot of similarity about, They're like, fighting over you the, huh they fighting over you <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure who is fighting over me. That would be fun. Um, but it's about like how like a lot of progress in integrity circuit is just like it's a lot of it. It's just engineering challenge that like, you need to like pack in a lot of translators on the same board, and it's incredibly hard. Yeah, uh, I think with these kinds of models, like um, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but um, one of the biggest NLP models around today is Wudao 2.0, which is Chinese, mm. and and GPT-4, I think, is going to be one of the biggest when it comes out. Even just yeah. the number of chips that are required for training these models, just acquiring that many chips yeah. is crazy. Wow. They are taking away all the chips that the crypto miners give up on. So, <laughs> Yeah, this is a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Bitcoin prices yeah. down is good for being able to train AI models relatively more affordably. So anyway... I think I want to go back to this like training data. I yes. feel I have a lot of thoughts on yes. it, right? So, so I yes. do believe in it a lot. So I feel like, so it's really funny because so when I when I graduated, I thought it's like okay, hardware is a is a way to go. So why I joined Nvidia, and then I was, I was like, okay, now we need next component. It's like training data, and then it's just when I was uh, I joined Snorkel, which is like a way to like with supervision to like push you like augment, like to create more training data. So I do think it's like as the models get bigger nowadays. Um, not many people can afford to train model from scratch. So we see like a lot of like foundational models. So I do think what is actually is a competitive advantage of companies could be like training data, like how to get data that only they can get their hands on. Um, and, and that is like, um, that is, that is big. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah. So what kinds of, um, with training data being so important, what kinds of data preparation methods or what kinds of techniques could our listeners be employing um, you know, that are underutilized out there? So I do think that we need to change the way we look at data. So it's very important things. It's like, so so when we, so AlexNet was trained on uh, ImageNet, right? ImageNet was created by a lot of people labeling images. So on Amazon, you can see the mechanical Turks. It was listening like, what, how much? I think something like two cent, uh, an, an image label. So so like traditionally like annotations or like dealing with data, green training data set is considered like a, a, a low skill labor. And people like you can if you label a lot of images an hour super fast, you pretty make around like minimum wage. But but nowadays like if, if you the thing is it's like you can think of one example of labeling is the teacher teaching your kids. Like like okay, so 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 kids wanna do some homework and the teacher looks at it and said, Okay, this is good, bad, how to improve it, right? So like if you want the kids to be like, really smart. You want to send them to like good teachers. And I similarly, I think that like if you want the AI to be like smart, you want to have like really smart people to annotate. Right. So a lot of like annotation is like easy to do, like image, like whether there's a car in the image or not. Right. Uh, but but I think a lot of annotation is really hard to do. Like first of all, look at chat GPT response. Like how do you know that it's like a good response? Or like how can you make it even better? So, so, so you need like, so you need like, smart people like how do you change the perceptions of data annotations so that smart people want to do it yeah this is a this is definitely a big challenge so for example maybe you want to train a radiology data set you're going to need yeah. to pay a radiologist uh to be yeah. labeling your images as opposed to mechanical turk yeah and then it's going to be orders of magnitude more expensive to have those experts yeah. do it but 
if you can pay them to do it, you're going to end up with a really valuable data set. Yeah. So I think like that's, a, that's a one main thesis of like Snorkel. And I thought it was very interesting. Is like how, so Snorkel, like waste supervision is this idea of how to encode domain expertise so that it can be reused. So like a lot of time, for example, like um, some domain expertise, like a, a doctor can look at a note and say, it's like, hey, this is not contain something like pneumonia or like some dangerous disease. So that should be like promoted to urgent. So, so that is some kind of, you can encode that. So like if you have the doctor say, like, okay, if the doctor note contains certain keywords, then give it like the weak label or noisy label of being urgent. And like now just not have like one rule, but if you have say a thousand of those like that, and you can like, resolve the conflicts and looking at the noisy labels, each simple rule gives, which can have you generate some pretty accurate Groucho label. Cool. Yeah. So that's very cool. Tools like Snorkel can be used to encode domain expertise into our training data. Um, we had a guest on not too long ago named Cheyenne Mohanty, who yeah. talked a lot about this. You know him? Or, no, I did uh, not know him. No. Yeah. Now, episode 635, he talked a lot about how yeah, problems with training data and even how like these mechanical Turk kind of systems are quite exploitative. Yeah. And so we can be using more clever technology like Snorkel, um, yeah. or in his case, Watchful is the name of his company to mm. be, uh, yeah, creating higher value data, um, yeah. without necessarily that, that exploitation of people. Yeah, true. Nice. Um, related topic. So once you have your training data, um, some kinds of models, like some deep learning models, we put our data in more or less raw. We don't engineer features out of the data, but yeah. for a lot of kinds of model types and a lot of kinds of problems, engineering features out of our data is critical for our machine learning yeah. model to working well. So you have a chapter devoted to the topic of feature engineering in your book. What's the secret chip of engineering good features? Oof, oof, it's a lot of, um, that is like, Wow, I felt like how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think feature engineering is um is, is pretty hard. So, I would say this like first I would look at the type of use cases. So, there are certain use cases that where a lot of feature engineering can be automated. So, for some use cases like um that use text or like images. So, you can have like most of the data comes from like maybe like a blob of text or a big image. So, which you can like input into a model and get out embeddings. So that kind uh, of feature engineering is pretty much automated. So what's the challenge for feature engineering is um, how how to engineer from more tabular data. So for example, for like fraud detections. So you have data coming from different sources. A lot of them are numerical. Um, a lot of them are not really, of course they have some text as well. Of course some people are treating the, the entire transaction as a blob of text. And you can um, just input into a model and get the embedding for that transaction back. Uh, another approach is that you can look at a lot of users' activities and try to use the quantum like behavioral activities. So to like make predictions. So for example, a very simple example is that um, say if you as an account holder has been only uh, spending on uh, make very few transactions, maybe uh, on average like one a day over the last six months, and suddenly in the last ten minutes you were farming, you were like doing a hundred transactions. That's very suspicious. So that's that's kind of like measure the numbers of transactions you did in the last 10 minutes is a feature or measuring like what is the average amount of transaction you make every, you made you have made every day over the last six months is a feature so that kind of, of features you usually need to think about and usually require certain domain expertise people to come up with and they can blow up really really quickly so we see pretty commons in the companies we work with they have like thousands of features and we were talking to a few um, companies where the majority of their cost comes from future computation. Right, from future yeah. computation. Yeah. yeah, so like future engineering, so the, the traditional sense is that like data scientists try to just create as many features as possible because usually having more features will 
gives right. a model better performance, but at the same yeah. time, when so we we work in like real time machine learning space. So what it means is that we want to be able to help companies leverage fresh data to make better like more accurate decisions, right? So for instance, on fraud detections, um, of course you can do like slow predictions. For example, like somebody steals a card, you when observe them for like thirty minutes and then make predictions. But like in that thirty minutes, that hacker the scammer can cause a lot of damage so we've seen often cases where people say like they can just reduce the time from second to like milliseconds they can save them a lot of money or another use case account like email email takeover for a business account uh, so if somebody get a hold of like uber.com email or like apple.com email they can pretend to be that person and send out like malicious link to the rest of the company and which can cause a lot of damage. So like, if you can catch, maybe that's that person that's locked in and immediately say like, wait a second, two minutes ago, you were locking in from California and now you're locking in from like, I don't know, some like very random islands very far away. Then maybe, maybe it's suspicious. So, so mm-hmm. if you can leverage information very fast, then you can, save a lot of headache and like increase like more accuracy because now model can use like fresher data to mm-hmm. make like more accurate predictions for the situation right now. However, when you do things as a scale um, or like as a speed, you, you just have to spend a lot of money because so we see that um, we, we saw like some companies and not even that big, uh, but they do things very inefficient. Um, so they just store everything in memory, like data from the last three months in, in memory. And it ended up cost them like, I have a million or like a million, of course, of course, depending on the scale, I don't feel like I just throw the number yeah. out there, but like a lot of money a year, uh, a month or a year. And we saw that like we can come in and like, optimize the process to reduce like not 20% or not like 30%, but like 10x, like reduce the cost of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about your company and this real time machine learning thing in more detail. So your startup is called Claypot AI. You talked about that. Uh, earlier, how it's uh, how does that relate to food? Clay pot is like for cooking food. Food, yes. Do you never eat? You have never eaten food in a clay pot. Uh... Oh man! When you come to Vietnam, I'm oh, sorry. When you come to the Bay, we will take you. Nice. Now, now you have to take me to Vietnam. You already offered it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, so clay pot AI is developing a platform for real time machine learning. Yeah. So. Um, you've alluded to kind of what real-time machine learning is now. So it aims to make online prediction more accessible. So tell us what is online prediction? How is that different from the more traditional batch prediction? Um, Yeah, what are the challenges that you're tackling at Claypot? So online is pretty much um, an overused term. If you got online, can mean many things. And I think the meaning has changed over time as well. So I would say that's a force to help companies like being more um, reactive. Right. So, so for example, like if somebody, so, so batch prediction usually have some scheduled batch jobs that runs maybe every day or every hour. So usually a lot of cases, for example, uh, a lot of use cases don't need online predictions. So like if you do like something like churn predictions, like predicting what percentage or like what, what, which of the user is going to cancel the subscription, you can probably do that like once a day, right? You look at all the users and see like, oh, hey, which one is not likely to cancel in the next week or something. So you can offer them some discount or some benefit to like pull them back in. Um, but like for, for use case, for example, like when recommended systems, when, when you have a website and people go on the website, you want to be able to leverage the information of that users and make them relevant info, like recommendations to keep them like stay, right? You don't want to wait until the next day or like next four hours after they have already left because like what are you going to use the recommendations for? Uh, another big case is like like for addictions or like um, dynamic uh, dynamic pricing. So, so you want to like come up with like the best uh, price for uh, to show users. And I think it's very big in Amazon. Um, so Amazon for a product, there might be multiple sellers. And they have in the buy box, only a few buyers or sellers can make it to the to the buy box, right? So as a seller, you want you to customize a price so that you get into the buy box. So that could be a, a big case uh, or like Uber, um, Lyft, they use dynamic pricing as a way of um, as a way to reg- regulate supply and demand. So say if some users, so like if right now they are not, 
many drivers on the road. So they might want to increase search charge to get more drivers on the road and, and, and vice versa. So I think it could be very, um, there's a lot of use cases. It's just like, it just makes a lot more sense to be able to make predictions based on what's going on right now, instead of like, like do it like every four hours or every day. So another very big benefit on like predictions is that it can save cost. So say you run a delivery app, uh, whichever I think uh, Grubhub has published the re- like the, uh, the, med- the statistics, but the idea is it's like, if you have a lot of users and every day you just predict uh, predict like what restaurants these users are going to order today, you're going to waste a lot of compute. And the reason is that like not all of these users are going to log in the app and order. So say like for Grubhub, like it's like, I think it's like only 2% of the users order a day. So if they generate for like all of the users, the 98% of the predictions are gonna be wasted, which is like cost like significant compute and so like delay, because maybe if it take like them like uh, six hours to generate on those predictions, then they can only generate every six hours. Cool. Yeah. So uh, real time machine learning enables people in some circumstances like fraud detection to save a lot of money, and so it makes uh, it makes it a no brainer to be using a real time machine learning platform like Claypot. So what's your like? What's Claypot's angle? Like, how does Claypot enable real-time machine learning in a way that you know people might not be able to do on their own? So, so first thing I would go into analysis. Like, what makes it so hard for companies to do this? So, one thing we have realized is it's like, of course, is a cost um, aspect, right? Like, going from like batch to, to online can cost a company a lot more, both with like upfront infra investment and also the like operational cost, like both with people maintaining the job or like uh, infrastructure costs, uh, like storage or computation costs. So, so we do look into how do we simplify that as much as possible and make it as cheap as possible. So we spend a ton of time on like optimization to make the cost like reduce significantly. And it's like, it's crazy. Look at the benchmarks and like, well, like companies are wasting a lot of money on this. Um, and the second is the usability. So as a data scientist, um, do you use pandas? Of course. Yeah. So so it's like it's very for like when people, when data scientists work with batch features, it's pretty easy to experiment with a batch feature, right? You just like get into the uh, CSV file or some of the like table, and you just like experiment uh, with some new features and train and model on it. And if it works, then it's great. But like when when you switch to like streaming, having more as a time sensitive feature, for example, like. Um, the number of transactions you have made in the last 30 minutes or the number of views this product has had in the last 30 hours, or like the last 24 hours, or just get my more time sensitive. You want to be able to like go back in time and like get it's like, it's correct a certain point in time. So, so say like, if you want to make, uh, is a prediction happen at 10, 30 a.m. yesterday, you don't want to use a feature that was available as like 10, 30, 1 a.m., right? Because it's like be like picking into the future. So, um, so, or like, um, when, when you compute the feature in productions, you're going to be connecting to like data sources, like a streaming topic, like a Kafka topic, a Kinesis topic. And it's just not that easy to, to like, for data scientists to like use them and like experiment on top of them. So, so what we do is just like, we, we focus like how we can make data scientists like experiment with streaming features as easy as how the good experiment with batch features. Because we have seen in some companies like, hey, the process for the machine experiment and deploy a streaming feature would take like two months or like a quarter. And in the meantime, it was like, okay, this is so much pain for me. What if I just use like 10 batch features instead? So like it's, it's the, the difficulty in usability makes users not want to like do streaming features, even if streaming features are like bring a lot better return on investment. So so yeah, so that's what we do. Like first we do optimizations and second we increase usability. Nice. Yeah. So Claybot, you are spending your R and D time figuring out how other companies, how your clients can be cutting down on their operational costs and be able to do real time machine learning uh, cost effectively. We want to make it just as easy as you would have used like pandas. Nice. Um, so Sounds like an amazing company. Obviously, working for you would be amazing. Um, are you doing any hiring right now? 
who aggressively. Um, so oh, yeah. we are looking very strong engineers who are interested in streaming, who are solid engineer because we do build things at scale. Uh, a lot of our customers just operate things in like large scale. And when you do things in um, at a scale, you want things to be reliable. So we do want people with good engineering practices, good. So, so my, my CDO, so our CDO say it's like good engineering craftsmanship, craftsmanship. Yeah. Engineering craftsmanship. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sounds like an amazing opportunity. And for all of our listeners out there that would like to be as productive as you, uh, so <laughs> running your own company, uh, up until recently teaching your Stanford course, obviously writing your book, uh, and being a huge contributor to the data science community with your posts on social media platforms and GitHub and so on. Oh, we have an um, ML uh, Discord. It's uh, 14,000 um, 14, members now. It's pretty fun. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so you'll have to give me a link to that so I can mm -hmm. make sure yeah. that we have it in the show notes. Um, and um, so, yeah, yet another thing that you need to be on top of. <laughs> um, so... I think that you might have a really interesting answer to this kind of productivity tips question because before we started recording, um, so if people are watching the YouTube version of this, you might be able to tell that Chip is standing. <laughs> and uh, prior to recording, I had to ask her to stop walking because she's on a treadmill. <laughs> and <laughs> so I could hear kind of the treadmill noises as, and as I was like, oh, we're not going to be able to do that when we're recording. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Clearly, you're getting some uh, cardiovascular work in uh, Belly. while you do calls. Um, what other kinds of productivity tips do you have for us, Chip? Um, so I think, um, okay, so I feel like I don't, I don't think I'm that productive because I have so much more <laughs> admiration for people who both work full time and have been kids. I do think that like having kids is just so right. much time. And I feel that's a like good productivity tip. Don't have kids. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, um, people might take it the wrong way if I say that. But but um, I do think that like, I feel like I'm able to like be able to focus on work because I don't have a lot of distractions outside of work. So um, yeah, um, some productivity tip is just being. A little bit more disciplined, um, having understand like how my what causes my me not being productive and try to like reduce the time. So for example, one of the things I do like working remote a lot is because I don't have to commute from one place to another, uh, and I do think it's like a big time sucker. Um, yeah, having I do things like so and so and look, it's like my energy level sometimes like having certain conversations give me like a lot of energy to do more like productive work, but sometimes a conversation is like kind of make me drain. So I do things like what kind of conversation is just like make me like happier or like more energized and do more of those and like look at conversations just drain my energy and do less do less of those. That is such a great tip. And all of those kinds of things are in my productivity tips arsenal as well. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I would like to have kids someday, but I'm like, man, that is gonna be a productivity hit. Um, wow, but it's, life is not all about productivity, you know? I know, so I've read. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, avoiding a commute, this one is huge. Um, and yeah, I love this idea. One that I hadn't maybe thought of actively, but engaging more in conversations that leave you feeling energized as opposed yeah. to draining your energy. I think that that is really key. Nice. So um, I hope that this conversation today uh, has been one of your energizing <laughs> ones in the day. But I also know that I've eaten up a lot of your precious time today and that you urgently need to get going. So we usually ask for a book recommendation. Maybe you can just throw out the words, <laughs> the name of the book, but the key piece of information that our listeners need to go on from this episode is how they can be following you after the show. So I do like to read about really smart people about how they think. So I recently actually shared on LinkedIn, like a list of books that I've thought I'd learned a ton from last year. So one of them is actually I have it right here, like complex adaptive systems. It's very good system thinking, uh, about system thinking. Uh, for example, like how, one example is this, how do you set incentives so that like every individual can just focus on like for their own interest, but at the same time can make progress for the whole organization. And I think it's really, really hard to do. So it's very interesting book, just explains that. Um, I do like some other books, uh, like, uh, let me see in the bookshelf here. 
um, how not to be wrong, uh, the power of ma- mathematical oh, yeah. thinking, oh, uncommon yeah. genius. Uh, it's very interesting. It's like the author studies a lot of Mark Arthur Grant uh, recipients and see like what helps them like be creative. Because the thing is, it's like in hindsight, it's very easy to think like which ideas succeed, right? But when even the weight of it, like having had been working on it for years and without like recognitions, how do you get gain the conviction that it's the right thing to do and keep on going? Like when to give up and when to pursue, continue being perseverance. I, uh, I think it's a very hard question. Another is a very interesting book. I think I like Fast and Fallacies from a Martin Goller, uh, Mar- Martin Goner, which is another mathematician. He's talked about like some different like facts and fallacies and how we both fell for it. So it was written like 70 years ago, but I feel like it's so like relevant today because first of all, like why people fell for anti-vax or like why people fell for a uh, flat earther when there are like so many like strong evidence against that right so it's, it's really good book a very interesting book he's he's a really funny person as well uh, another book i really like is from one to zero which is not yes. a misspell people keep asking me do you mean like zero to one so no no no, no. <laughs> from one to zero so it's about like how different cultures like arrive at like number systems so actually mm-hmm. it's a really big mental jump and a shift from having the numbers that got from one, two, three to like having the concept of zero, nothing. So I think it's a very interesting book. Uh, so yes, a lot of books like that. Nice. All right. And then, so if people want more book recommendations in the future from you <laughs> and lots of other kinds of guidance in their lives, especially related to real-time ML systems and that kind of thing, how should people be following you? I know that you have a course coming up uh, in a platform Sphere. called Sphere. Yeah. Yeah. So it's on the information on my LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn now, also on Twitter, and I'm very active on Discord. It's called ML Ops Discord, and you can also find the information on my LinkedIn, on my website. Um, yeah, I really like the Discord community because I think it's a it's a way for people to just uh, discuss a lot of things um, about ML Ops. And it's not just my perspective. I think there are certain like many members who are very, very helpful. Like you can ask the questions and you would get a lot of really helpful answers. I usually go there when I have like, um, oh, I'm thinking about this. And I usually like get some like good perspective out of it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, clearly a lot of people enjoy your perspectives with the, whatever you said, 14,000 people in the Discord channel and you have 158,000 people following you on LinkedIn at time of recording. I'm sure it will be many more by the time this episode is published. So Chip, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Super Data Science Podcast. I understand that it's only your second ever podcast appearance. (laughs) So we are delighted. And there are so many more questions that I had for you. We're going to have to bring you on again at some time in the future and hear how things are coming along at Claypot. I would love to. I would love to. Maybe you can bribe me with food and I would come back. But yeah, <laughs> Sounds nice. great. Uh, Ria, thank you so much for making time for me. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And feel free to ask me any questions about things that we discuss here. And have a nice day. Yeah, bye-bye. Well, now you know why Chip is so enormously popular. She's unbelievably intelligent and oh so very fun. In today's episode, Chip filled us in on how most machine learning models never make it to production, but she's bent on fixing this. How some kinds of ML models need to have their model weights updated in production at a much higher frequency rate than others. How orders of magnitude more parameters have yielded stunning results like we've experienced recently with ChatGPT, but this corresponds only to overcoming ML engineering challenges as opposed to some data science ingenuity. She talked about how domain expertise can be encoded in training data labels to create higher value data, how online learning involves ML models learning in real time from individual training points as opposed to on batches of data, and how she ratchets up her productivity by engaging in more energizing conversations and fewer draining ones. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Chip's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 661. That's superdatascience.com 661. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by following me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. 
Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another magnificent episode for us today. For enabling this super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors, whom I've hand-selected as partners because I expect their products to be genuinely of interest to you. Please consider supporting this free show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get all the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. And thanks, of course, to you for listening. It's only because you listen that I'm here. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.